power. I believe that fits what I owe to God. Within my power, I have a responsibility. The requirement is, this is what you're going to do. It's demanded. Now, was giving demanded in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Is giving demanded in the New Testament? Okay. The thing about it is, is, is giving, is the demand of giving in the New Testament, do, is the amount demanded? Why not? What do you think? Why do you think tithing is not mentioned in the New Testament. Do we, we use that term a lot, don't we? And tithing was done in the Old Testament, and we say it's 10%. It's not 10%. I, I tried to calculate that thing one time. I think it's somewhere around 31% is what tithing actually represented when you looked at all of the different things they had to tithe. And that doesn't even count the fact that if somebody owed you something after seven years, you had to forgive it. You had to relinquish that debt. So tithing was, was more than that. But that's not taught in the New Testament. Why? Why do you think? Ed? I think because Jesus gave it all. I think because on the cross, it was, uh, it, that, those sins were taken care of. Those folks in the old, old law, they had to give for because he wasn't here yet. They had to, uh, the whole Okay. It's not about the money, it's not about the, it's about everything. It's all. Okay. You give your time, your effort, your your life. Yeah. So giving it all, I think, is to me, that is the difference. Uh, if, if I if I go up and I you tell someone that, hey, you need to give ten percent. Okay. All right, that's pretty easy, isn't it? You can give 10% and not give your all. You're just giving 10%. So if God owns your money, if God owns everything, Jesus bought everything, and everything belongs to God, then I don't own it. If, if God tells me you give 10%, then I own the 90. At least that's my, my thinking and perhaps that's one of the thoughts or one of the reasons why tithing or an amount is not specified. Okay. Did Right. And so they're just kind of doing some grace and some mercy. And I in the last couple of weeks, and I was I was in here last week, um, much read that about this particular scene. Um, they're using the kingdom of the word all, that they gave all. And I want to make sure that we that this and maybe you've heard of this one, I'm just glad I know it, but Okay. Somebody have another version uh, that they could read, verse 34. This is the New American Standard. John, you weren't here last week, but you had asked me the week before, I think, hey, what version is that? It's the New American Standard. Someone have another one? All who own land or houses sold them. It said all who owned. Okay. All right. For all who were owners of land and houses, okay. So, does all mean all? 
uh, and I, I, I don't mean to be facetious about that because sometimes you do have to dissect those words. You have to use some common sense. We talked about the poor widow that gave all, that gave everything that she had. Does all mean all? Well, in that case it did. She gave everything she had and didn't have a lot to live on after that. But I think that as I begin to try to understand, and I, let me tell you something. I, I was going to mention this at the very beginning. This is the second time I've gone through this material. I did this like six or seven years ago. And man, I, I, when, I, when I started putting all of this stuff together, I re remember realizing that, man, I don't know near the amount that I thought I did on giving and what I should give and everything else. I'm telling you, Ed, the more I study it, the worse I feel about it. <laughs> I don't know anything about what does God really want from me. And if we get anything out of this class, it's this. Strip away whatever you have in your head of what you think God wants you to do with your money. Just forget it. Open your mind up and let's look at some examples of what the early church did and then let's say, hey, what, how does that apply to me today? Am I supposed to go and sell my house and give everything to the church? Doesn't seem rational, does it? But it doesn't matter what it seems. Is that what it, it's saying or not? I don't think it is, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you absolutely cert with certainty that it's not. But I do know one thing. I do know that it's talking about their attitude and about their heart. And if I needed to go and help someone and I didn't have the means, I remember, here's a, a story about my grandparents. I remember, and I... I, I, have a, I have a real personal struggle with debt. I hate debt. I don't want any debt. And I've had debt in the past. But I, I don't like debt. But I remember one time my grandparents lived in Missouri. And their congregation needed to build a building. They were in some similar situation than we were. They had outgrown themselves. They found a little piece of land. They decided to construct a building. But guess what? They didn't have any money. They didn't have near the resources even that we had today. So do you know what they did? They all pulled together and they looked at some equity that they may have in their homes and they remortgaged their houses and went and built a church building. Okay, did that's different than my heart today. You know, do I want to go mortgage my house and give it away? Would I do that if called upon? These people were called upon to go sell their land and sell their houses for a need. And they were willing to do it. How that applies to me, I've got to work and try to figure that out throughout my lifetime. To try to be pleasing to God. But it's here for a reason. So we're going we're gonna to come back to this over, over the quarter uh, and so we've been talking about why is money so important. Now we're going to talk about materialism. And are, are we going to answer all of these questions? Absolutely not. We're not. All I want you to do is to try to strip away what you've been thinking about money and finances. And I, I have walked into this building feeling good about what I'm doing with my money. And I'm not sure I should have. So uh, before we uh, go any further, let's, uh, let's have a prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word and for the power that it has to mold us and to change us. And Father, uh, no matter where we are in our life, we can, we can continue to learn, we can continue to grow, help us to have that spirit. We know that we have looked in Acts chapter 2 and seen some massive changes within the hearts of your people. And Father, we want to draw that uh, here today and apply that to our lives. We want to see changes. We want to change, Father, not to show others that we've changed, but to show you that we've changed.
and that we're striving, Father, to follow you and follow your word. Just help us to do that in this study and just help us to think about our own lives and not think about one another, but just uh, internalize the things that we talk about so that we'll be better servants for you, we'll be more generous for you, Father, and we'll just continue to grow and be a better example for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let me tell you where I'm at in this study. I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable about it. Um, I'm starting to feel like, man, I, I'd rather just not deal with this right now. Um, I'm, I've been kind of content on what I've been doing up to this point. But, you know, any of us who know Christ and who have his spirit within us, are we ever really content? I know that the Bible talks about worry. We're not to worry. We're not to fret. We're not to be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. I don't know how to do that, but I'm, I'm working toward that. But I'm not sure I'm content with my life, but I, that doesn't mean that I can't have joy and I can't have happiness. But I, I can't be content because I don't feel like that I have fully grasped Christ's teaching. I, I, heard a, I heard a preacher say one time that we have all truth right here, every bit of it, everything we need to life and to godliness. We have all truth. We don't know it. We don't know all truth. And uh, I guess the, the fear, the anxiety, all the things that I shouldn't be doing, I guess, I guess uh, the fear of dealing with what God expects me to do with my money uh, is exceeded only by the fear of me not doing it, if that makes sense. I don't want to stand before God at the end of my life claiming to be a disciple without truly coming to grips with my life, with my money, with my possessions, with my attitudes. So I know I can't plead ignorance Especially, I've said this before, that the Bible talks more, has uh, more verses devoted to money than to faith and prayer combined. So I know it's important, has to be important. Uh, somewhere around 2,350 passages about money in the scriptures. So I'm, I, I guess I'm not trying to be critical to you because I'm, I'm always just critical to me. So I'm just sharing with you some things that, that I've thought about. But I want to approach this now in, in a different way, not a critical way, not, oh, man, I don't think I can do this. Oh, I don't believe I've been doing this stuff in the past. I want to approach it with an exciting opportunity to grow, exciting opportunity to improve how I manage my money and my possessions as we move forward. So if we understand a proper relationship to money, first of all, we've got to define money. Money's more than dollars and cents, coins and paper. It's just a tool that simplifies trade. That's all money is. <clears throat> you know, God, back in Deuteronomy chapter 14, God encouraged the Israelites to take advantage of the convenience of money. They had all these crops and all these different things, and uh, he told them that since their place of worship was so far away, convert it into money, and then when you get back, convert it back. That's Deuteronomy 14, 24 through 26. Uh, money allows us flexibility. Flexibility to exchange goods. You know, if you had to just barter all the time, uh, you'd get a bunch of stuff you didn't want. Money wipes that out. Money allows you to go buy something or, or sell something and then take the proceeds and get what you want. Um, so since it has no inherent 
value. Uh, only ascribed value. Money is not wealth. It just symbolizes wealth. Uh, you can't eat money. You can't plow a field. You can't grow money. Money is nothing more than a pledge of assets, a means of payment, a medium of exchange. That's all money is. It's morally neutral. You know, people say so many, so many times, money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money. Money itself is morally neutral. Uh, and money has social and economic benefit. Uh, it can be used to help people for the betterment of a group of people. Uh, Christian compassion can accomplish uh, great things through the giving of our money to help eliminate suffering. Money can be used to feed, to clothe, to provide shelter. Money can be used to to go to Guatemala and help High and Byron and their group continue to advance the gospel. It can go to Bear Valley and continue to try to train preachers to preach the gospel. It can fund all kinds of different things. Money can appear to be really good. But it's really the giver who's doing good and money can be the instrument for the giver to do that with. On the other hand, money can buy cocaine. Money can fund terrorists. Money can bribe people. Um, you know, water is a gift, but have you ever seen a devastation of a flood? Um, fire is a gift, a warming gift but we've seen the destruction that it can bring. Money's neither the, the disease or the cure. It is what it is. It's neutral. We either use it well or we use it poorly. Uh, either way, how we use our money is absolutely critical to our spiritual lives. Um, Luke 16 and verse 9 says, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of the unrighteous, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Any idea what that means? I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, see if it makes any more sense. Uh, here's the lesson. Verse 9 says, Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an internal home. To me, this is telling me, use what you have. Be generous with what you have. God wants you to do that as he welcomes you home at the end. So, to make friends for yourself by means of wealth, of the wealth of unrighteousness, Jesus uh, is transferring the principle illustrated by the story of the unjust steward here. We just need to use our present resources to plan for eternity. Have you ever thought about you need to use your money to plan for eternity? Uh, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Uh, the world is filled with financial planners, isn't it? I have a financial planner. He tells me all kinds of stuff, and I just look at him like, man, I hope this guy's right. Uh, it's good for Christians to learn how to use money wisely. I think this is saying it's good for Christians to learn how to use money wisely in this world. Plan for eternity with your money. Yeah. I think it's also uh, saying don't try and hold on to it. Eat, drink, and be 
Okay. Agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, I, I was trying to think of an example. I like, the, I, I like the term plan for eternity. Take your money and plan for eternity. And I was thinking about an individual, and I wouldn't name their name, but I was thinking about an individual. Here was a man and a woman, and they didn't have any kids. And they had lived their life over the years, and they had had sisters and brothers who had kids so they had got their their enjoyment from through their kids and everything and when it came to the end of their life what are they going to do with their money what do we typically as parents want to do for our kids we want to leave them something or at least some people do uh, so I, I've, I've even been guilty of the uh, I'm, I'm glad Jeremy's in here but I'm glad Beth's not in here to hear this I hope that I die and there's not a dollar left, <laughs> you know. Amen. But really, I don't. That's that. I'm not being honest with myself. I have the inkling to want to leave my family something, you know, whenever I'm gone. And a lot of people do that. So I've planned, tried to plan for that. I've tried to invest for that. But how do I invest for eternity? How do I plan for eternity? This young, this couple that I'm mentioning got to the end of their life and they had accumulated quite a bit and guess what they did they said hey here here's this here's this here God you get all you get every bit of it yeah I know I know my niece took care of us when we were sick I know that uh, a lot of my family rallied around me when I was sick but God here you go my plan and their plan was long before they ever got to the end. The plan was, here's what I'm going to do. Maybe that's the beginning of starting to think about planning for eternity. Uh, because at the end, we, we don't have anything except who we were and what we did and how we served God. And I want to serve God the very last day, just like now. So I was thinking about uh, the importance to invest the, our resources now for the Lord and not wait to the very end. How do I advance the cause now? I've heard people say money is always evil. I've heard other people say money is always good. Neither statement is true. Uh, the two perspectives aren't correct. Uh, so let's look at two oppose, these two opposing views for just a minute. Um, we're going to talk about asceticism. Anybody know what that means? What does that mean? Okay. Just deny yourself of everything. Extreme abstinence. That's asceticism, okay? That's one extreme. What's the other extreme? Materialism. Man, I'm getting every penny I can get and I'm spending it on me. I am going to do nothing but accumulate. That's my goal. Uh, you know, I, I saw an interesting definition of materialism that said money-centered rather than God-centered. That's materialism. So, do you think we're materialistic? Do you think you're materialistic? Don't raise your hand and don't answer. Just think about it. When you travel to other countries and you see other the way other people live, you wonder how could we not have materialism rub off on us a little bit in this country? I, I don't know. I, I know that I do so many things, maybe even in a materialistic way, and don't even know it, don't even realize it because I have so much. 
God has blessed our country and, and our lives so much. I don't care if you make $35,000 a year or you make $435,000 a year. You are so rich in this country. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And I think it's, it's described well in Proverbs 30, uh, verses 8 and 9, where it says, Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not may, uh, that I not be fully uh, that excuse me that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord, or that I may not be in want and steal and profane the name of God. So, what the writer is saying here is keep me in the middle. Don't give me too much. Don't make me starve. Keep me somewhere in there so that if I'm starving, I don't steal. And um, if I am just so consumed with money that I don't deceive and I don't lie to gain, to gain more. Um, next, uh, in Luke chapter 7, Kind of a long reading here, but let me let me kind of get through this, and then I want us. To, we'll probably end up spending the majority of the rest of the time talking about it. But Luke chapter seven, starting in verse thirty-six, it says, "Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table." It's talking about Jesus, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his head with, with the, and his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. And now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He'd know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one that he forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, a lot in this in this passage. Um, Luke's gospel, if you look at it, really, if, if you look at the different gospels and the themes of the different gospels, Luke's really deal with Jesus was dealing with people who were suffering and people who were outcast. Jesus did that. Luke really does key in on that. And he keys in on Jesus showing compassion and those in power who would challenge Jesus when he would do that. That's what's going on here. Uh, Simon, a Pharisee. We don't know his name until we get further down in there, but this, this person is, is Simon, a Pharisee, and he has invited Jesus to come over and have a meal. And suddenly this uninvited guest shows up, this woman, this sinner, and we saw what all that she did. 
many uh, commentaries, I was trying to, trying to look at this in, into more detail, point out that all of this anointing could have something to do with his with with predicting resurrection and all that stuff. I don't know. I don't know if if, if that's what this is talking about or not. Uh, uh, Jesus does. Are the recordings of this story are a little bit different in Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, and John 12. But I want to focus on a small detail for a minute where it says Simon, and it says, he said to himself, okay, here's Simon, he's standing back, and he sees Jesus dealing with this woman, this sinner. And he doesn't blurt it out. He doesn't say it. He just says it to himself. <laughs> if he was really the Son of God, if he was really who he said he was, he would know who he's dealing with here. But he doesn't, I don't think he's bold enough to say it, personally. And uh, so he silently says this to himself. In Mark's version... The onlookers object to the woman. Okay? Not Simon, but the onlookers, if you read that in Mark 14 and verse 4. Which implies that they spoke aloud. But interesting that Luke's version says, Simon, what he was thinking in his heart. Uh, in Matthew, the disciples object openly. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. In John, Judas Versus concern out loud. John 12, 4 and 5. Only Luke highlights Simon's unspoken thoughts. But Jesus knew what he was thinking. When he, when he, he knew exactly what he was thinking. Even though all this stuff is coming at him, and this is fascinating to me, here's this guy and he's thinking this thought in his head. Jesus has all this stuff going on. And he starts addressing the guy who has this thinking in his head. If you knew who she was, you wouldn't be doing that. And so, what does this mean to me? And it's, it's a way that I've looked at, I've read this verse tons, but I've never thought of it that way. What do I ever say under my breath? in my head about things that are going on that may or may not be correct. And something really kind of jumped out at me. How many times do you drive around town and do you see somebody standing out there with this cardboard sign? And I can tell you what pops into my head every time. They ought to get a job, you know? They're, obviously, they're lazy. Obviously, if I gave them money, they're not going to spend that money correctly. So I, I'm not going to enable them. Is that right? Is that correct? It's not always the case, is it? And, you know, some of those people that would take the money and not spend it correctly, that could get a job, they're kind of making it bad for some of the other people, aren't they? Because we're, we're drawing that conclusion. I can just tell you that I don't see any difference in what I just said about what I think sometimes when I see those people than what Simon thought when Jesus was helping this lady. She's a sinner. If he was helping her financially, they would say, she's not going to spend that money right. She's not going to take care of it. So, what do we say subtly to ourselves? And how do we, how do we think about that and change that? I'm not going to... The answer to that question that I just have, I don't have that one for you. I have some answers maybe for me, but I, I can't. You, you guys may say, oh, no, 
I, I help them sometimes. I never do. My oldest daughter does all the time, helps them all the time. And I've even asked her, why are you doing that for? She goes, you don't know. You don't know if they rip. Which side of generosity do you want to end up on at the end of your life? Do you want to end up saying, I didn't give it to them because I knew they weren't going to use it right, or I gave it to them, they didn't use it right, but I was just trying to do the right thing? Where do you, I, want to, I, want to, I want to err on the side of over generosity. You know, I, I, I get it that you can't be an enabler. I get that. But sometimes I use enabling as an excuse to do nothing. And I think that's a lesson, or at least a lesson that I'm going to take away from this particular passage that maybe I didn't before. Uh, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, Paul speaking about people who have given over to deceiving spirits. And in verse 3, he talks about men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be grateful, uh, shared by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with gratitude for it is sanctified by the means of the word of God and prayer. So this is kind of dealing with asceticism. This is dealing with people who they, for, they abstain from all these different things. Uh, they abstain from certain foods. Um, and it's being dealt with by Paul. So what are some of the keys that I can look at or I can learn from, I should say, to use my gifts more wisely. And I look at verse 4. Everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. So, the gratefulness that I should have uh, versus trying to twist that thing around and, and say, oh, I'm just going to deny myself of everything. I think Paul is dealing with that here. Uh, also in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, it says, it says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix, the, uh, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So this, to me, is a good passage to try to balance asceticism and materialism. One, don't be conceit, conceited. Don't uh, fix your hope on uncertainty and riches. Fix your hope on God, who richly supplies all things to enjoy. You know, material. Uh, the enjoyment part is sometimes what leads us to materialism, but God expects us to have enjoyment. Just don't fix your hope on riches. Uh, also in Luke 12, uh, we're going to look at this. We'll only have time to look at this as a snippet, and then we're going to go ahead and read Luke 12, 13 through 21. We'll pick up there next week. But Luke 12 and verse 15 says, Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. If asceticism isn't the answer, abstain from everything, what about the opposite materialism? Jesus warns. He said, beware. Be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of that stuff. Uh, the world measures us by our stuff. But Jesus says, that's not how you're measured. 
uh, it's a warning. It relates to my choices and my priorities as far as how I'm to be on my guard. When I make priorities and choices with my money, I need to be on guard that I'm not being greedy, that I'm being generous. And uh, just because I have a, an abundance, if I do, then I'm, go I'm to be generous with that abundance. So um, we're going to pick up at Luke chapter 12. We're going to pick up right there. And uh, we're going to read 13, really 13 through 21, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Any, any questions or comments before we wrap this thing up? Ed? I think that your responsibility goes the other way, too. You don't just give it all away. You say those people on the street, if you take time to get to know them, if you take time to stop, if you take time to the situation, uh, uh, there's an obligation that you have. It's not just about going out there and giving it all away. You know, we've done it here. I can tell you, we've done it to brethren and gave them everything for a year, pay their bills totally. And where are they today? And what did they do? And when they got all squared away, where are they? And what did they do? So you have to judge righteous judgment. You have to, God doesn't expect you. There will always be poor among us. He doesn't expect you to just go out and give everything you have away. But you have a responsibility to get to know us. Okay. To bring them in. All right. And I, I agree, Ed, that we all have a responsibility to, to do that. All I want to do is say, am I using the responsibility and what I've done in the past, what I've thought in the past, have I, am I using my mindset to be greedy, to not give like I should, or not? I, that's, that's the question that I'm going to ask, and I'm not, not disagreeing with you at all. Okay, thank you.